What if the world had a car that was reliable, good on gas, low on emissions, and cheap to buy? Emphasis on cheap. The least expensive car you can buy here in America is $18,000 new. Who has $18,000 they can just drop on a new car? Normally you have to finance it, and then four, five, six years later, when the car is paid off and you wanna sell it for whatever reason, it's worth maybe a quarter of its original value. If you ask me, the new car industry is kind of a scam. It's not always a great decision financially to buy a brand new car. So what if we had a car that was so affordable you could buy it outright, it saved you money on transportation costs, whether it's gas or hybrid or electric, doesn't break, and you can use it for a long time. It's really simple in concept, but pretty ambitious in reality. But by making the whole project open source where all the files are available for free, and any existing shops or manufacturing facilities can manufacture this thing on their own, I think we can blow the doors open on this opportunity and make it a reality. Welcome to Project Osaki. So I've been developing a lot of concepts for a lot of different experiments and potential products over the years, and all these things are very near and dear to my heart, and I had hoped to patent them one day, but I'm a man of limited resources, and I can't afford to patent one of these ideas let alone all hundreds of ideas that come in and out of my mind on a regular basis. So, I decided to share them with you guys on YouTube in hopes that someone out there can benefit from them, that this car can benefit from them, and not only this car, but I'm sure these things, if they turn out to be viable products, can have many different applications. So, that's why I went open source with this thing. Among these ideas are a gas-electric hybrid rotary engine, a single rotor wankel with electronic efficiency booster, a longitudinally phased electric motor for rear wheel drive hybrid retrofits, a DIY fiberglass infused thermoplastic for inexpensive body panels, and a variable diameter intake or exhaust tubing for more efficient combustion. And then of course, the 3D printed intake manifold for the Miata race car. As with any experiments, failure is to be expected and whether any of these things can turn into viable products is anybody's guess. But something I can tell you for sure is we're gonna learn a lot of cool stuff, we're gonna build a lot of cool stuff, and we're gonna make sharing ideas contagious because I think that's what the world needs right now. So over the coming weeks and months and years, each of these ideas and experiments is gonna get their own series of videos. And in this video, I'm gonna give a brief overview of each individual thing for you so you know what to expect. And with that, let's talk about the car design. And if I've kept your attention this long, please give this video a thumbs up because the better this video spreads, the better the chance we have of making this a reality. So the first core design feature we're talking about today is spacious tandem seating. So we're gonna make this car as skinny as possible, reducing the frontal area as much as we can, because according to this formula, which calculates the total drag of a vehicle, it's actually more effective to reduce the frontal area than it is to lower the CD. So it's more effective to make it skinny than it is to make it slippery, but we're gonna do both anyways, which will result in a pretty fuel efficient vehicle, I believe. But we don't want it to be cramped, right? It's tandem seating. Uh, it's easy to envision this as a cramped, you know, driving compartment, passenger compartment. We wanna keep it spacious. So we're not trying to cut the width of a normal car in half. We're just trying to reduce it by maybe 35 or 40%. That way you retain good elbow room, leg room, head room. And it feels like you're in a you know, spacious driving environment despite the fact that it's so narrow. Another cool benefit of having such a narrow vehicle is the concentration of mass. So most of the mass is at the center of the vehicle. You'll have drastically less weight transfer to the tires and you can make the tires much more narrow, further reducing the frontal area and fuel efficiency of the car. But in order to get a little bit better braking performance and cornering performance, we can increase the diameter of the wheel to get a little bit more rubber on the road as we're driving. Let's head on over to the computer where I can show you the 3D model that I've made in Blender. I am not skilled in surface modeling on a 3D program, and you'll see the result of that right now. In case it needs to be said, this blocky gray model doesn't represent a finished result. It's a rough draft. Just gives us a basic idea of the type of dimensions we're aiming for. So super low frontal area, less than that of a sports car, but overall it has a larger footprint similar to that of like a mid-sized sedan or something like that. I want to sit the people tandem, so front to back, instead of side to side because most cars on the road have a single occupant in them. So it's a waste of energy 
to push the air out of the way for an empty compartment when you have side-by-side -side seating. I get it, the car's a little funny looking right now, but I think uh, we put some effort into styling, we can make this look really cool. So there's a cool aspect to this being as it's open source that I wanted to highlight real quick. So let's say you're a shop or a facility and you have the means and desire to make this car and you really like the body, but you don't like the powertrain so much. You can develop your own powertrain, keep it proprietary, there's no pressure on you to share it open source, the way this project's open source, and you can use the body that you like for free. You don't have to pay anything to use the files, they're commercially available. The only caveat is, if you make some sort of development to the body that makes it more efficient or something like that, you just have to share that development data with us the way that we share our development data with you. It's a nice little give and take, keeps it fair. So as you can see, the possibilities are virtually endless for this thing. It's really exciting, and there could potentially be dozens of companies that are making their own variation on this body um, that's a little bit more sporty, maybe can carry more passengers, maybe a little bit more off-road capable. It's, uh, it's really exciting stuff. So the second core design feature is kind of three points all in one. So the first is the inboard brake system. I want this type of system on the front and the back. Um, it's just the brakes aren't inside the wheel, they're, in, they're mounted to the frame. So by doing that, you need to run an axle down to the hub. Um, and it's a little bit of a challenge for the front because it doesn't necessarily need to have a uh, gearing system or a transaxle or anything. Unless we make it all wheel drive, which isn't out of the question, but that's not a core design feature. So this reduces the unsprung weight, and not only that, but it allows the brake cooling system to be stationary instead of having to be flexible, you know, to move with the wheel. And also, it reduces turbulence around the wheel, so you can seal that wheel off completely. You don't need to use the wheel to cool the brake system, uh, so you can seal it off and reduce the turbulence around it and lower the CD. Point number two on, or 2.2, I guess you could say, is this entire suspension system should be modular. So every corner of the car, I want to have the exact same component, same brake rotor, caliper, axle, spindle, control arms, everything. So that way it's just cheaper to buy parts, it's easier to have parts availability, you know, it's just all cost focused stuff. Um, and then 2.3 on uh, the core design feature is this inboard suspension setup. So the coil spring and the shock will also be on the inside and this is just to further reduce that frontal area and reduce the unsprung weight so you'll have a nice ride quality because you won't have to move that mass up and down as the car goes over bumps and uneven surfaces and uh, yeah it'll probably handle pretty nice too and then we come to the most controversial feature of all the powertrain tree huggers hate anything that burns gas us knuckle dragon grease monkeys don't like electric cars so how do you please everybody i think it's hybrids i think hybrids are really cool you motorheads might disagree with me but Think about it, you can get where you're going, hear all those lovely sounds of the internal combustion engine, save a little bit of gas on the way, and have extra torque from your electric assist motor when you need it. Not a bad shake in my opinion, I think hybrids are the future, love me, hate me, that's the direction we're going for this car. So with that, let me give you a brief summary of the first three experimental designs that we're working on right now. Sweet. So here we have the humble 12A rotary engine. Some of you might be wondering, why did I choose this engine for our first Project Osaki powertrain experiment? Well, it's a simple answer. It was the only running engine I had to work with, so here we are. What we're gonna do is turn this gas burning rotary into a hybrid electric gas burning rotary. We're not taking away any of the fuel burning qualities of this engine, we're simply adding a assisting electric motor into this intermediate housing. It's gonna be an axial flux motor. It's going to be reluctance based, so there will be no permanent magnets. We won't have to worry about crossing the temperature that a permanent magnet will lose its magnetic ability uh, because we're only gonna be pulling on the steel in the rotors. So there are so many questions to answer, so many problems that I've already identified before I started digging into this. And uh, we're gonna go over all that in a dedicated video on this project, uh, but for now I'll keep this overview flowing and we'll get right into the uh, single rotor experiment that I want to perform. So the reason this experiment is only applicable to a single rotor um, is because the fact that the second rotor is 180 degrees out of phase 
um, will make it not work. So a problem with the rotary engine is uh, incomplete combustion. It throws a lot of raw fuel out of the exhaust port and that's why it can't pass emissions, right? Because it doesn't burn all the fuel because this combustion chamber is shaped really weird and it's moving away from the flame front and you end up having combustion still occurring by the time, oh, I'm spinning this the wrong way. I actually have this backwards. So here's your, let's start at the, okay, so compression just finished right there. We're on the power stroke. So the mixture is exploding in this combustion chamber here. The combustion chamber is very quickly moving away from the flame front. And by the time the exhaust port opens, the combustion is still occurring and we send a lot of raw fuel out of the exhaust. So my theory is, what if we had an electric motor, maybe similar to the one that we plan to use in the two rotor design, or maybe just an external electric motor, doesn't really matter. What if we had an electric motor that slowed the rotor down during the power stroke? So it kept this rotor moving slow to give the fuel a little bit more time to combust. And at the same time, as the motor is being used to slow down this rotor, it's generating electricity. So it's charging the battery, it's slowing down the rotor, we're getting a more complete burn, and hopefully we could save a little fuel while also charging the battery at the same time. So the hypothesis is that with a little bit of well-timed speeding up and slowing down of this rotor as it goes through its four-stroke combustion cycle, we can make it burn cleaner and charge a battery at the same time. Is it possible? I don't know, but I think it's worth testing. All right guys, so hold on to your hats because this longitudinally phased electric motor is the creme de la creme of everything that I've been thinking about for like probably the past six years. So hold on to your hats. Help. All right guys, this is a conventional synchronous reluctance motor in a very simplified orientation. So you have your phase one. You can see that when phase one turns on, these two electromagnets are connected. This bar will wanna align itself so that it's lined up with the first phase. And then as it rotates around, when phase two turns on, it'll wanna align itself with that. So it always stays in sync, synchronous, to the phase that's on. And the number of poles on your rotor normally matches the numbers of poles on your stator although the configurations start to get pretty wild looking when you look at them in practice. In principle, this is how they operate. And this is how my motor is different. I'm gonna keep it really short and sweet because I'm gonna do a full video on it, but for now, just know that I took the phases, which normally go around the circumference of the motor, and I made them longitudinal, you know, across its length. That way, you can take this upper stator section and push it up into a drive shaft tunnel and still have great ground clearance, way more than you would have if this motor had a full circumference of stators, the way a conventional design would work. So you can install this in a rear wheel drive car to make it a hybrid without modifying your floor pan at all. So I'm super excited about this. I've been working on this idea for a really long time and very soon you'll have a full length video on the topic. The last two points I wanna to touch on, on the car overview at least, are really simple. We can go through them quickly. Minimal cost adding tech, so not a bunch of gadgets and gizmos and doohickeys on the inside of the interior. We're focused on reducing the cost as much as possible, but this is open source, so we might try to make the interior modular where other companies can add you know, different modules and components to you know, give it the tech that they desire. Uh, but for the most part, the base model of this car will be very simple inside. It'll only have what you need to get from point A to point B and be reliable. And last but not least, classic styling. It's got to look cool. I think what some people miss the mark on when they're doing concept cars is they make it so like streamlined and slippery. You know, you're supposed to follow a teardrop shape to make the car aerodynamically efficient, but they make the cars look like an actual teardrop which I think is very uncool. So we want to keep a little bit of sharp angles or whatever we can do to make the car look visually appealing because that's super important for you guys liking it. So to demonstrate our last two experiments that we're working on, uh, the DIY fiberglass, I actually already did its first full length video. So you can check it out right, let's see, right here. And on the 
variable diameter intake tubing or exhaust tubing, something I just freaking thought of recently, like last week, I think. And uh, basically, let me get a marker. I was thinking, well, what if instead of making an intake tract long for low RPM performance, what if you just decreased the diameter? It seems like it'd be more effective. How could you do that? So I was thinking, what if you had a flexible membrane and two chambers where the outside chamber pressure dictated the diameter of the inside membrane? So you have your outside chamber, something like this. That might be too low. Let me bring it up. Oh, you know what? I drew, I drew all this on the other side of the board. Let me just spin the board around. Let me put some new wheels on this. It does not spin very well. All right, so this is our restricted position, smaller diameter, our wide open position. You'll have two chambers and a flexible membrane. The outside chamber you'll, will, be temp, will be pressure adjustable. So with less pressure here than here, you'll open it up and you'll have a wide open position. And when there's more pressure in the top chamber than there is in the middle, it'll be restricted and you'll have better low RPM performance to a point. I mean, can't be closed obviously. So you'll have a perforated tube so that when the pressure is higher here, um, it doesn't bulge out in the middle um, because that wouldn't be advantageous. So this is, this is a harebrained idea. I don't know if it'll work at all. I don't know if a flexible membrane exists that can withstand like mileage, you know, if it'll last at all. Um, but uh, hey, these are experiments, right? They're not products yet. We're just testing stuff out and learning things as we go. It would be really cool if you could implement this in the exhaust side as well, because then if you could restrict the diameter of the intake and the exhaust at the same time at low load, low RPM, you get a pretty efficient engine, I think. But as for whether you could find a flexible membrane that could withstand exhaust temperatures, the jury's out. You heard me say it earlier, and I'll say it again. During the course of Project Osaki, we're gonna learn a lot of cool stuff we're gonna build a lot of cool stuff and we're gonna make sharing good ideas contagious. So if you wanna learn more about the project, check out the links in the video description. And until then, 